Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. My name is Ethan, and today we are doing the Roman Triumph by Historius Villus. The last one, the Roman Pomerium, was very interesting, though I really knew nothing about it before the video started. I will say I know a lot more about the Triumph, big military parade, one of the high points of a political or military career in Rome, so I'm excited to get into this one and learn a little bit more. So let's get started. A little while ago, I went over the concept of the Pomerium, which was the invisible line that legally separated the city of Rome from the rest of the world. Right. I mentioned how any unauthorized crossing of the Pomerium was a death penalty offense, and how even authorized crossings through one of the city's designated gates automatically transformed soldiers and generals back into private citizens. This legal mechanism basically made it impossible for Roman armies to enter the city with any legitimacy whatsoever. Mm. That is, save for one enormous exception. Today we're going to talk about that exception, the Roman Triumph. Ah. The Triumph was Rome's highest honor, and to a society absolutely obsessed with honor and dignity and authority, that's saying a lot. The triumph represented the apex of a person's career and yeah. a grand public acknowledgement that they were one of Rome's most powerful politicians. So what was the Roman triumph? Put quite simply, it was a big old parade. More specifically, a big old parade in which a victorious general and those under his command were granted special permission to cross the Pomerium and enter the city of Rome for one day. This was a singular honor. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We really don't have anything like that today. I mean, we mostly seem to hate our elected leaders. So can you imagine, you know, an elected leader doing something so great that we give them a big old parade? Well, I, I can hardly imagine that happening. You know, mostly if you think about, like, uh, anything like a politician throwing themselves a parade, it's probably in some sort of authoritarian country where they can throw themselves a parade at their own discretion, but, you know, in our society, in a more democratic one, you know, we're not throwing parades for any of our politicians or leaders, so this is sort of an interesting thing to us. There were a specific set of conditions that had to be met before a triumph was even on the table. First, a general had to conquer new territory for Rome. Second, that general had to be acclaimed imperator by his soldiers, which was just an honorific title that means one who commands. This acclamation meant that the victorious general was allowed to add the word imperator to their name until a triumph was held in their honor. Ooh. By the way, this is the root of the word emperor. Yeah, that's interesting. Third, the victorious general who had been honored with the title of Imperator had to return to Rome and ask the Senate to meet with him outside the Pomerium. Hmm. Remember, a general's command authority evaporated whenever they crossed the Pomerium, and this rule also applied to the title of Imperator. Fourth, if the Senate agreed to exit the Pomerium and meet with the general, he would run down a detailed list of his conquests and accomplishments, which he would end by formally asking the Senate's permission to cross the Pomerium under triumph. Note the wording here. The Romans considered the Pomerium central to the concept of the triumph. Yeah. Fifth, the Senate would vote. Sixth, if the Senate approved, the general's request would be kicked down to the plebeian assembly. And if they approved, that was pretty much it. For exactly one day, the general would be authorized to retain his command while he led an army across the Pomerium and into the city of Rome. Big honor. As you would imagine, this approval process could break down at any one of these steps. Plenty yeah. of generals conquered territory, but were never acclaimed imperator. Plenty of imperators never got to make their case before the Senate. Such was the case in the year 60 BCE, when Julius Caesar, after conquering some territory in Spain and being hailed as imperator, returned to Rome and asked the Senate to meet outside of the Pomerium. The Senate, led by arch-conservative Cato, responded to this by strategically dragging their feet until after that year's elections, hoping that the promise of a triumph would stop Caesar from running for consul that year. 
Caesar famously confounded expectations yeah. by crossing the pomerium just in time for the elections. I, I've heard of this story. Uh, come on now, Caesar's all business. You know, he's going to get what he wants, even if it means giving up a great honorific. Forfeiting his command and his title of imperator. Mm. He would go on to decisively win his election, although yeah. I don't think he ever forgave Cato for denying him his triumph. Yeah, I'd he be pretty pissed. It later, though. It's cool. With that, let's get into the actual mechanics of the triumph. Ooh. The ritual was quite complicated, so we're going to come at this from two directions. First, we're going to get our bearings by seeing what the triumph would have looked like to the average Roman. Mm. Then, we're going to go back and follow the triumphal general from the beginning to the end of the triumph. On the big day, the entire city basically shut down, and residents gathered along the pre-established for <laughs> route to watch the day's celebrations. The procession was basically split into three distinct stages. Stage one. The first stage kicked off the triumph with a long line of wagons. The first of these wagons carried a bunch of three-dimensional models and billboard-sized paintings showing off wow. Rome's newly conquered territory. The average <laughs> Roman would have been largely ignorant of the outside world, and so before the triumph could get into full swing, the public had to be taught what they were triumphing for. If possible, huh. these wagons were usually accompanied by every exotic animal from the newly conquered territory that the triumphal general could get their hands on. Okay, th this is actually really fascinating. Like, the Triumph, they had to educate the people on where they just conquered. You know, think about it. You're a, someone who lives in Rome, just a regular citizen. Y you've never seen Spain in your life. You may never have seen a painting or anything. You, you might not know what it's even about. And now... You know, you're having this big triumph for it. It does make sense that they would roll out all these paintings and animals and, like, this is what we just conquered. That That's actually pretty cool. That's really interesting. The weirder, the better. <laughs> Elephants and giraffes were always a big hit, which makes sense because they are objectively the weirdest animals. I mean, imagine seeing a giraffe for the first time. You know, your closest point of reference might be, like, a horse... And now you're seeing this big yellow horse with spots and a really long neck that's massive. You'd probably be very confused slash amazed. <laughs> this was followed by even more wagons carrying paintings and models depicting key battles or events from the Triumphal General's campaign. Hmm. This was equal part education and propaganda, as you would imagine. Yeah. Well, maybe a touch more propaganda. Yeah, I'm sure. This indoctrination was followed by another series of wagons that proudly displayed the spoils of war yeah, to the public. The money Bones, wagon. Precious metals, expensive clothing, religious artifacts, whatever. You can kind of piece together the narrative that the Romans were trying to tell themselves here. Show an exotic place, then show the Romans conquering that exotic place, then show the treasure from that exotic place flowing into the city. Mm. It was a very simple piece of propaganda, but people loved it. I'm sure. Also, not to be a downer, but history is often a downer. The spoils of war portion yeah. of the triumph included human beings. Yeah. It was considered a real feather in one's cap to have a foreign monarch dressed in their full regalia march in one's triumph. We're not going to linger here, but hold these prisoners in the back of your mind, because they're going to come up again. Yeah, that's a little more unsavory. You know, if we were going to do a modern version of this, we could keep the human prisoners out of it. <laughs> you know, that that's, that's not as fun as the elephants and the paintings and stuff like that. That was it for stage one of the triumph, which, if we want to generalize, was basically the education slash propaganda portion of the day's celebrations. Hmm. Stage two was the main event. Ah, this here we go. This was where the triumphal general, also known as the triumphator, there's your $10 word for the day, made his grand entrance. The triumphator appeared to the public in a special triumphal chariot, pulled by four white horses. Wow. This chariot was decorated in gold and purple, and affixed uh. with charms to resist magical spells. Okay, well that's interesting. I mean, purple has been a very important color throughout history. You think purple, you think royal. 
regal, monarchical. So I, you know, you can tell it must be important because of its role in this ceremony. The Triumphator wore a very strange attire. His toga, which normally would have been white, had for this occasion been dyed completely purple. Mm. This may not seem that weird to us, but it was to the Romans. Purple was and is the color of royalty. And yeah. because of this, Rome's highest elected officials were allowed to wear a little purple stripe on their togas while they were in office. This stripe was a subtle nod to the fact that Rome's magistrates wielded the powers of the old monarchy. But any more purple than this was considered gauche and offensively <laughs> anti-republican. Yeah. And yet, during the triumph, the triumphator was permitted to make his grand entrance dressed head to toe in purple. <laughs> the royal symbolism was unmistakable. It's a pretty big deal. And the symbolism didn't stop there. The Triumphator's face would have been painted red, which was a reference to the red statue of the god Jupiter on the Capitoline Hill. Oh. Jupiter was the king of the gods and the unofficial patron of the city of Rome. It was said that only the gods could violate Rome's pomerium, which I think explains this bit of role-playing. If the triumph was ever considered religiously problematic, it seems like dressing up like Jupiter solved that problem. <laughs> I guess so. To cap things off, the triumphator also wore a crown made of leaves from a laurel tree. This was a thing that was loosely associated with the god Apollo, but the Greeks also had a tradition of giving these crowns to winners of competitions, so it was generally associated with the concept of victory. Hmm. In his hands, the triumphator carried a branch from a laurel tree and an ivory scepter. Taken as a whole, the triumphator appeared to the public as an almost king and an almost god. It was quite the thing to see. You can kind of see how later on in Roman history, you know, when we have the emperors, you start to have the deification of some of these emperors, thinking that, you know, these emperors are, you know, demigods, if not gods. Already at this point, you know, obviously, especially after this whole day's over, people know that this person's not any kind of deity, but the symbolism, you know, is already suggesting some sort of, you know, kingly appearance and also an almost godly uh, appearance. So, you know, you can kind of see how eventually we get to the deification of, you know, people, of leaders. Behind the triumphal chariot, men and women from the triumphator's extended family had their moment in the sun. The triumph was considered so prestigious that even this brief appearance was enough to kickstart some of the younger male relatives' political careers. Nice. This option was not available to the women, and so if they were introduced to the public, it was usually in the context of them being a virtuous wife or mother. The third and final stage of the triumph belonged solely to the Triumphator's army. When the mm. Senate and people of Rome gave a general permission to cross the Pomerium and enter the city, they implicitly gave the same permission to the army that had hailed him Imperator in the first place. After years on campaign, this army would have been pretty happy to be back in Rome, and discipline would have been virtually non-existent. One fun detail from this stage in the triumph is that as the soldiers marched, they sang rude or body songs <laughs> for the crowd. In an incredible stroke of luck, we actually have the text to one of the songs from Julius Caesar's triumph in 46 BCE. That's great. Every translation of this song is wildly different, but it basically went something like this. Romans, watch your wives. Here's the bald adulterous <laughs> whore. We pissed away your gold in Gaul. And <laughs> oh, that's great. Caesar, of course, that's great. was the bald adulterous whore. Some translations use a different word in the pissed away your gold line, implying that the gold was spent on prostitutes, if you know Ooh. what I mean. As you can see, these songs... That's so funny. Just imagine, like, all these soldiers come walking through Rome. They're basically just partying. You have crowds of civilians on either side, some respectable people, a lot of politicians, and they're singing about, <laughs> the, you know, Julius Caesar is an adulterous whore. That, that's honestly hilarious. I love that. Songs were extremely disrespectful to both the Triumphator and to the people of Rome. But yeah. they were also funny, and this kind of open rudeness was tolerated and even expected when an army returned to Rome under triumph. 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like if I was a civilian, I would have loved that. I'm sure plenty of people thought it was hilarious. So, that's the three stages of the triumph as seen by the average person. Mm. Now, let's rewind and follow the triumphator step by step through their day. Ah. In the early morning, everybody participating in the triumph met outside the pomerium on the campus marshes on a tiny, conveniently located racetrack called the Circus Flaminius. When the wagons and the animals and the soldiers were all in the right order and ready to go, the triumphator mounted his gold and purple chariot and they were off. There's some fragmentary evidence that suggests that a slave may have rode behind the triumphator on his chariot for the duration of the triumph. If this was in fact the case, they may have been responsible for holding a golden crown above the triumphator's head while they whispered a phrase into his ear. There are a bunch of different versions of what this phrase may have been, but it would have been something like, remember, you are human. <laughs> the Whoa. reason I didn't mention this before is because if this was a thing that happened at all, it was probably a later invention that only existed for like 10% of Rome's triumphs. I mean, in those pictures, it looks like <laughs> the individuals on the top left are angels, not slaves, but I could be wrong. If that is true, what a very like weird personal <laughs> thing to do. Like a whisper into the ear, remember, you are human. That's got to be a very strange job to have. And even that evidence is inconclusive. The triumphal procession exited the Circus Flaminius and made their way onto a street that was lined with spectators. From here, the procession headed towards something called the Triumphal Gate, which mm. we think was located near the southern tip of the Capitoline Hill. This gate would have been uniquely decorated for the triumph, and it was here, as I've mentioned before, that Pompey tried and failed to squeeze through the gate in a chariot pulled by elephants. Right. This was probably rather embarrassing, and four white horses had to be substituted in before they could continue. So you should have just stick with the traditional white horses. You don't need to fix what ain't broken. Uh, you're going to end up embarrassing yourself trying to fit some elephants through a small gate. <laughs> Inside the pomerium, the triumphal procession slowly snaked its way through the streets towards Rome's most famous racetrack, the Circus Maximus. Mm. When they reached the racetrack, the entire triumphal procession went inside and did a few laps before an overflowing crowd. Wow. Even the most conservative estimates say that the building probably accommodated at least 150,000 spectators. That's massive. Which means that if the Circus Maximus were still in use today, it would still be the highest wow. capacity sports arena in the world. Yeah. When the Triumphator made his entrance, the roar from the crowd would have been audible throughout the entire city. Wow. That's insane. From the Circus Maximus, the triumphal procession followed the base of the Palatine Hill, deliberately tracing the path of Romulus's original pomerium from when he founded the city. In time, the procession reached the Via Sacra, or the Sacred Road. This was one of Rome's main arteries, and, as the name implies, home to its most significant religious buildings. Rome's richest citizens would have waited to see the triumph on the Via Sacra, just so they didn't have to rub elbows with the plebs down in the Circus Maximus. Of course, typical. This road headed straight into downtown Rome, which is where the procession finally came to a halt, right in front of a building called the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, which mm. means exactly what you think it means. Jupiter, the best and greatest. Right. I said earlier that those prisoners from stage one of the triumph were going to come up again, and oh. that time is now. Oh no. When the triumphal procession stopped at the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, most of the prisoners from earlier in the triumph were pulled aside and ceremonially strangled in uh. front of the crowd. Let's be real. This was a horrific tradition. Yeah. By the standards of today, it was a war crime performed as part of a religious ceremony before cheering crowds. It's repulsive. 
Even back in those days, non-Romans considered this aspect of the triumph unusually cruel. Mm. Many people opted to kill themselves, just so they wouldn't have to go through the humiliation of being ceremonially murdered in a Roman triumph. Yeah, that's terrible. I don't want to get totally sidetracked here, but Romans usually took care not to execute people within the pomerium. So it's strange that they didn't even blink an eye at mass executions during a triumph. Also, it's awfully suspicious that the executions happened to take place at the foot of the temple to Jupiter Optimus Maximus. The Romans liked to say that they didn't believe in human sacrifice, but I don't think it's going too far to say that this feels a little human sacrifice-y. Yeah, uh, definitely. <laughs> the senseless killing was over with, the Triumphator got down off the chariot and ascended the steps to the temple. There, with Rome's highest religious officials, he sacrificed two white bulls to the god Jupiter. Again, noteworthy that this happened only minutes after the execution of the prisoners outside. Mm. This animal sacrifice was the climax of the Roman triumph. By now, it would have been pretty late in the day, so Rome's bigwigs hosted a big formal feast for the Triumphator, while the crowds went home and had feasts of their own with friends and family. That night, after way too much eating and drinking, <laughs> lictors and musicians escorted the Triumphator to his home. The moment the sun rose the next day, the Senate's permission to cross the Pomerium expired. Since the ex-Triumphator probably lived within the Pomerium, that meant that their military command instantly evaporated, just like it would have for any other general within the Pomerium. The ex-Triumphator was a private citizen again. But the festivities weren't over. There would be several more days of feasts and games and wow. horse racing and all kinds of stuff. Literal bread and circuses. Yep. Most of this would have been at the ex-Triumphator's personal expense, which for this moment made him the most popular person in Rome. If we are to believe Rome's internal record keeping, over the course of seven centuries, the city celebrated, on average, a triumph every three or four years. But with the ascension of Rome's first emperors, this ancient tradition faded away. Oh. It was gradual at first, but over time, it became less and less permissible for the most popular person in Rome to be anybody right. outside of the imperial royal family. Yeah. Like I was mentioning earlier, getting into the emperors, we have them being considered a sort of king slash, at certain times, god by the people. So, uh, I'm sure the emperors were not fond of having the most popular general, you know, march through the streets of Rome with the symbols of a god and a king uh, on him, and people viewing him that way. You can understand why a Roman emperor would not like that at all. This decline of the triumph coincided with a general meritocratic decline, which was a trend that infected every aspect of public life and led to greater and greater political instability. Mm. In short, the triumph was a sign of healthy political competition, and when the triumph started getting all funky, it was an early indication that the funk was coming from inside the republic. Always gotta wait for the end song. All right, well that was a great video. Uh, I you know feel like I learned a lot about the triumph. Um, clearly the quasi human sacrifice slash mass murder was pretty horrible. Apart from that, hey, I love I love parades. I'd love to have more parades, parades and days of partying and feasting. Sounds like a great time apart from the mass execution that took place during it. You know, scratch that, and we have a pretty awesome time. But yeah, that was really interesting. Another fantastic video from Historia Civilis, as always. You know, they only make bangers, what can I say? Uh, if you guys enjoyed this one, please leave a like, uh, leave a comment down below if there's other videos you'd like me to react to. Uh, I had a good time with this one, I hope you did. Stay tuned for more videos, and I will see you guys again next time. Goodbye.